Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I spoke with James Martell, who is a professor in the Department of Political Science at San Francisco State University. He teaches courses in political theory, continental philosophy, anarchism, post-colonial theory, and theories of gender and sexuality. He is also the author of eight books, with this most recent book being Anarchist Prophets, Disappointing Vision, and The Power of Collective Sight. And all in all, guys, we had a really engaging and fun conversation. We shared a lot of uh, political disagreements, but it was really interesting getting his perspective on topics like anarchism and, and capitalism. And all in all, I felt like we had a really healthy, engaging, um, debate-filled conversation that I'm really excited to share with you guys. And yeah, if there's any feedback you'd like to share in the comments, I'd love to hear what you guys got to say. And without further ado, here's Atlas 011, James Martel. Give I some more of your meditation For it gives my inspiration All right, Professor Martel, thank you so much for being with me today. I'm really excited. I'm excited too. First topic I wanted to cover was sovereignty. And the first question I had about sovereignty was, what is researching and teaching legal theory and jurisprudence? I hope I pronounced that right taught you about sovereignty, how would you define sovereignty? Um, well, I've, I've, I used to have one definition of sovereignty, but I think I'm changing my mind <laughs> as mm -hmm. I've gotten older and wiser. Um, sovereignty, I've always thought it was a very bad thing. Um, it was a way to kind of control and dominate populations. It was a way to take political power away from people. Um, you know, one of the things I always teach in my classes is that um, in, you know, in liberal politics, they always say that the people are sovereign, but that actually doesn't mean anything in practice because the way things are set up, like you vote for somebody, then they just, you know, then they have all the decisions, they leave you out completely, and then you just sort of left, people are just sort of isolated and left to their own devices and not, they don't get to have a political life. So I've always thought that was a bad thing. But I've um, more and more been in, influenced by indigenous uh, scholarship where a lot of indigenous people from both from North America and South America have said, you know, uh, it's easy to say sovereignty is bad when you have it, but how about an indigenous nation whose sovereignty was stolen from them? So I've kind of started to think of sovereignty in a sort of a kinder way as just a term for uh, people being in charge of their own world and their own life. Um, so that's kind of a better definition of it. I think that unfortunately the Western forms of sovereignty tend to be very bad, but I think there could be other forms of sovereignty that aren't. Yeah, and uh, maybe the best way to, to sort of uh, approach this topic is for me to give what my rudimentary understanding of sovereignty yeah, sure. is and sort of contrast that with yours. If I had to give my very low resolution um, definition of what sovereignty is, it's, it has to do a lot with personal autonomy. We, we as sovereign individuals have, uh, can exercise executive function, mm. choose which place we want to work at. We can plan, set goals, define our ideals, yeah. take on pursuits. And one of the things that I've been really interested in thinking about is how do we in, uh, differentiate between individual sovereignty and sovereignty of sort of like government bodies and nation sovereignties? Yeah. So that's sort of like the, the understanding of the word sovereignty I'm coming into. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how do you think that contrasts with maybe how you think about sovereignty and define it? I think I think I, I like that. I just think that the problem is, is that political sovereignty often interferes with personal sovereignty. You know, hmm. so like I think I think there's there's different kinds of sovereignty. There's collective sovereignty. There's a whole community being sovereign together. There's personal sovereignty and then there's political sovereignty, which is how you actually organize as a as a community. And I think that um, personal sovereignty is really limited by the forms of sovereignty that we tend to have in the world. Like uh, that's why I'm an anarchist, because I think, you know, uh, what, the other forms of political organization I like to call archism, which is the opposite of anarchism, are uh, tend to take away a lot of your personal sovereignty in that in the sense that you've defined it, where you can buy what you want, but you can't have any kind of control over your political or economic life. Hmm. You're kind of subject to other to other forces, and that also limits your collective sovereignty because what I really think um, is important is that people should be able to meet and talk to each other. And uh, have and have those decisions be meaningful, not just uh, not just talk, but they can actually do what they want. And you can't do and, and our system is set up so you can't really do that. You can you, you have to sort of stay within the limits of the way power works in this country and in most other countries in the world. And so you don't have you, you don't have meaningful political power. You just you have like symbolic political power. Like you can you and I can talk about anything we want, but mm -hmm. we couldn't decide to be communists, right? You know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Or I mean to have a com to live in a communist world. There's lots of things we can't do. Uh, 
uh, as a, maybe a dumb example, but you know, it, it, it just to sort of think about uh, what we can and can't do. So I think I think personal sovereignty is extremely limited when you have political sovereignty of the kind that we have. Is it cool if I sort of outline an example and see if I follow the way sure. uh, your your definition of sovereignty? Um, I heard you mention uh, this, this sort of like uh, interplay and or like this force between um, government sovereignty and individual sovereignty mm -hmm. and how that sort of collides sometimes. One example that comes to mind after I heard you uh, touch on that was I've heard a lot of very pro Second Amendment individuals mm -hmm. talk about how they believe it's a per it, it, part of their personal sovereignty is their right in order to have firearms. And then yeah. there's this sort of like you can't own a fully automatic firearm. That's right. sort of like the law established by the government, which is thought of as like a sovereign entity. Yeah. Is that kind of an example of that sort of like interplay between the sovereignty of a government body yes, and the sovereignty yes. of an individual? And, and the, one of the only things that I have a little bit of sympathy for the right wing position is on that. Um, Interesting. I personally am, hate guns and I would never want to have a gun. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of anarchists that I like do think that a community where everyone is armed um, is, a, is a community where, uh, you know, by sort of by definition, the politics can't be as top down, you know, um, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I sometimes uh, feel like I've been, I'm living in a liberal society for so long that I, you know, there's part of me that hates that idea. But, but I, I, I do think that if people could take their own security as part of that would be that would sort of bolster their politics, I guess you could say. So yeah, but anyway, even even in the abstract, yes, I, I, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things I also thought about is like, I wonder if the fact that most large nations have access to nuclear weapons <laughs> incentivizes leaders of nations to engage in political dialogue rather than, uh, you know, uh, discuss, maybe not discuss, but just like have relationships that are much more combative or uh, that would have a, a increasing proclivity to like lead to war. And I know there are like wars and, and conflicts currently, but if you sort of compare that to um, this like idealized version of a nation where everyone is armed, mm -hmm. it does sort of seem like everyone has deadly recourse that they yeah. could rely on. Yeah. And it sort of makes everyone think like, okay, we have to have a conversation because the alternative is destructive. It's mutually destructive. Right. And, you know, I, I often think with right wing people, they only want like white people to have guns. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, the, my vision, everyone would have guns, you know, like so that it would be different. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, um, that's interesting about nuclear weapons. I, f I feel like nuclear weapons is kind of an ultimate Arcus tool to sort of make sure, hey, we can blow up the whole world if we want to, you mm. know. Um, so I, 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 I know people have said that they've led to peace, and I guess in some ways they have. But I would love to, if I could snap my fingers and get rid of every nuclear weapon, I would do it immediately. Huh. Because I, I think that um, it's, it's just not, it's, it, that is never going to be a collective decision or a collective power. It's always going to be a state power or a political power. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess we maybe would have more wars, but I think the threat of destroying the earth would be taken away, which would be great. <laughs> yeah. And I'm interesting, uh, interested. I heard you uh, say that you sometimes feel like right wing people, they want uh, gun ownership to mostly just be concentrated in white people and not uh, minorities. What, what makes you feel that way? What are some examples, maybe personal experiences that sort of give you off that, that yeah. feeling? Well, I have a real, ex real example, which was that in the 60s when the Black Panthers um, showed up, they actually mm -hmm. took advantage of the fact that California at the time was an open carry state. So that really? You, yeah, so you were allowed to have weapons. Oh, I didn't know that. And so they weren't breaking the law. They were walking around with weapons. Yeah. And Ronald Reagan, who was the governor of California at the time, got together with the NRA, the National Rifle Association, to put in a limit to uh, carry weapons. So that's the one time that the right wing actually curtailed, um, they, they, they strengthened uh, anti-gun control. Mm -hmm. uh, they strengthened gun control, in other words, because they didn't want black people to have weapons, right? And so, so that, was, that just shows you what I'm talking about. Like there's a kind of a, a complicated logic there. And I'm curious, was the, because I'm, I'm not familiar with that at all, was the way that Reg Reagan disincentivized uh, open carry gun ownership from black, uh, individuals that are part of the Black Panthers by uh, changing the laws about open carry or by like maybe designating Black Panthers as a terrorist organization and then saying individuals of terrorist organizations can't open no, carry? No, uh, sort of both. Okay. Uh, he made the whole the whole state like, uh, you know, uh, no longer an open carry state. So it has to be, you know, per permit and hidden and blah, blah, blah. Huh. But at the same time, yeah, they, they reigned like vi major violence on the Black Panthers, you know, and they, de they definitely declare them a terrorist organization and all that. So, yeah. Um, but, but as a result, we have a more, you know, liberal gun control laws, thanks to Reagan and the NRA. I think it's, it's hilarious. Um, yeah, I, I messed we, up. I messed up. I don't know. We used to be an open carry state. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. 
One thing that uh, you bringing up the Black Panther sort of um, makes me think about is I've noticed this sort of disconnect between how people my age think about race and racism and how people that are older and probably witness much more egregious acts of racism think about race. Mm. With me, you know, kids growing up in high school, kids growing up in middle school, it was almost just like overwhelmingly obvious that racism is bad and mm-hmm. it, not only bad, but just kind of dumb. Like we couldn't really wrap our brains around like, mm-hmm. oh, like my African-American, like it's just my, like mm-hmm. it just seems so foreign and like illogical to us that whenever I have conversations with people that are older and I sort of heard you bring this up with uh, the, the feeling you sort of have about who right wing people may or may not want to have guns is I feel like me and a lot of other people my age, we sort of operating under the assumption that like racism maybe isn't completely defeated, but it's like almost dead or on the ground. And it's always striking to me when I hear an older person speak about racism as like a much more present threat mm. because me coming from my lived experience, mm-hmm. you know, growing up in the Bay Area with mm-hmm. like a melting pot yeah. of cultures around me, it seems like something so foreign to me in my lived experience. Is that something that you sort of notice talking to young people here, Professor? It depends. It depends, I think, who you're talking to and where people are from. I think, I think like you, like my kids are also grew up in the Bay Area. So, mm-hmm. but I have to say, I think racism is alive and well. Like, if anything, really? I think it's just as bad as ever. I don't think it's gone away at all. In fact, you know, the rise of the new right is ex- is kind of explicitly racist, and it scares me. I think, um, I've, you know, I I do think that there's been a lot of good things that have happened, like um, anti-bullying campaigns in schools. We didn't have that when I was a kid. Like, people were just horrible. They were racist, they are homophobic, they are misogynist, <laughs> you know, openly. That has changed, and that has gotten better. But I think in general, you know, my experience, you know, I work um, at, 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 in my, fac- my faculty position. I also work for the union, and I help what's called the faculty rights panel, and we help people who have, you know, issues. And almost all the people I deal with are faculty of color. Who are getting all kinds of crap, hmm. so it, it's still it's still happening. I mean, this in my in my experience. Um, so uh, yeah, I wish racism was gone. I think that would be great, but I it's not. <laughs> I think it's very 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 alive. Um, I think it's worse in some places than others. That's true, um, but I think. Uh, yeah, I think I think there's a long way to go before we can declare racism. Is it all right if I offer like a little bit of skepticism? Yeah, of course. Of course, every podcast. I I heard you say like use the term as bad as ever. Mm-hmm. And that sort of makes me think like, you know, me and my rudimentary understanding and uh, education on the history of racism in America, it's like bad as ever, like bad as when slavery was around no, or not bad, as, bad. Not as, bad as during that. the civil rights movement or bad as maybe the 90s when we didn't have a black president before. Like where would you, would you sort of calibrate that sort of like It's a comparison? good question. It's a good question. I feel like the last... 40 or 50 years has been the right trying to take back the civil rights movement, and they've done a really good job. So they've pushed back on the Voter Rights Act, so now uh, it's becoming harder for black people to vote again. It's not as bad. Like, we don't have Jim Crow. People can drink at the same water fountain, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's been a long attempt, basically since the 1960s, to sort of turn turn everything back, and I think that group is doing a very good job, unfortunately. so yeah, so and and actually, when I meet civil rights leaders, you know, you know, San Francisco State, one of the things that's, that's very famous for is we had a third world strike here in 1969. What's it was, that? It was a uh, the longest student strike to this day, and I think in American history and maybe in world history, okay. no, probably not world history, but in American history for sure, and it created the College of Ethnic Studies. Okay. And um, and so there's those people are now in their 80s, the the students who who led that strike, and but they're still alive, and they're mm-hmm. and they come here and they say that they think that they have to start all over again. Like, the, in other really? words, the civil rights movement has to start all over again because it's like been pushed back so much in terms of, you know, what it accomplished. Um, really? Yeah. Like even, uh, cause when I think about civil rights, it's like African-Americans had to drink from a different water fountain. Yeah. So to me, it's like, there's sort of like a disconnect there with like comparing. Yes, I know, racism. you're right, you're right. I, I think racism has just become smarter. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not in your face anymore. It's okay. all like, you can drink from the same water fountain, but you can't get a job. Or you can, you know, you can, you you can, you know, you can go to the same school, but you'll be treated like crap. Or you mm-hmm. can go to the same school, but you'll be arrested by the police. Or, and when you go home, you know, it's just it's just like a, I think um, a lot of black a lot, black people, maybe especially, but a lot of just a lot of people still experience, you know, um, all kind all kinds of racism. But it's much more subtle. So it's more like gaslighting, I think. It's become more gaslighting. In the old days, it was just like in your face, boom, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I just think it's gotten subtler and more and more and smarter. So yeah, I mean, I wish this was I wish this wasn't the case, but I I do think it is the case. Just as an observation as well, I think one of the things that I and a lot of my other people my age find challenging when we hear perspectives like that is that it seems like okay, I'm being told that you know a person that's really experienced and brilliant has a ton of uh, experience teaching and studying politics uh, has a belief that. Um, racism is still alive and well. But if it's more subtle, or maybe as you described it, more sophisticated, mm -hmm. then it seems much harder to measure. Mm -hmm. And then that sort of like has, uh, it sort of like establishes this gray area mm. where it's like, is it racism per se? Is it personal pre prejudice? Maybe you just don't like the way the person acts, mm. behaves, dresses, yeah. sports teams, <laughs> you know, there's like yeah. all these different factors that go into, you know, uh, prejudices that we may have for um, other human beings, irrespective of yeah. their, their, their yeah. race. And it's, it, it seems like that's like a lot of the challenge of what a lot of progressive civil mm -hmm. rights leaders mm -hmm. now have in communicating the, their reasoning for why they believe racism yeah. is alive and well. I think, you know, I think you can measure it. I think you can't measure, you can't necessarily measure the actual, exp um, experience of, of racism, but you're going to measure the effects. Mm -hmm. Because like, I was listening on the radio that yesterday, and they were saying that like black people on average um, die much sooner than white people. They, uh, they have all, and it, there's all kinds of ways you can measure, and it's gotten worse. It's gotten worse. Like they've, um, since COVID, I heard like the average black family lost 50% of their income, whereas the average white family lost 25% of their income. And the average white family is back now, they've recovered fully, and the average black family is still I think they recovered a barrel a little bit, but not not. So there are ways you can measure the effects of racism. You can just look at you know who how many black people get shot by the police versus white people, how many you know percentages in jail and all that stuff. But I agree with you that it's hard to measure the thing itself. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's that's by design. I think it's it's gone kind of underground, if you will, and just gotten smart smarter. I mean, again, I wish I was I I, I wish this wasn't true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it is, and I think, you know, and I, I, I think, um, you know, because I teach this kind of stuff all the time, I think that racism is so fundamental to capitalism that it's never going to go away as long as we have a capitalist society. Hmm. Because I think, um, the, and I'm getting a little bit more abstract now, yeah. but, but um, I think that um, there was such a fear that, like, poor white people would get together with poor people of color in general and they would sort of have this that racism helped to divide and conquer like so poor white people they're like oh well you're you're poor but you're white so you're better than these other people you know what i mean and it sort of work it works really well um that, that's why you get this phenomenon in our country where poor people in this country poor white people are often vote very right wing hmm. you know even though and actually, this is all changing now. It's actually a very interesting time we live in. But traditionally, they would vote right wing for people that were only about giving tax breaks to rich people. You know what I mean? So they, so um, racism was, was, was a great way to sort of get popular support for programs that really only favored the rich. Mm. And poor people, poor white people were voting for them. That is still true to some extent. But I feel like the dog has caught the car a little bit now. And the racism has become a bigger, not just a tool, but actually has become... A central agent of what's going on in the in the MAGA movement, and you know, it's it's it, it's very it's I don't know what's going to happen about all that. Yeah, and I heard you mention you view um, racism and capitalism sort of hand in hand. Yeah. Just to uh, sort of give you a little bit more context about how I think about capitalism, you know, I study finance. I'm uh -huh. like yeah, yeah. pretty co pro capitalist. Yeah. So much of um, Silicon Valley being here, and so mm -hmm. much of uh, the history of the United States and the types of innovative companies and technologies it's been able to produce, I find like so inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, but I am interested in hearing your perspective on how you sort of connect like racism and maybe how capitalism might pro proliferate racism? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I feel capitalism is a very chaotic and uh, and I, I think unjust system. It, um, maybe we should define it first. Yeah, so. what capitalism is? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, it's changed over time. I think we, we now live in this phenomenon called neoliberalism. Before that, we had this thing called liberalism. It's not the same as how Americans use the word liberal to mean like okay. Nancy Pelosi. But it means 
it's just a an ideology that supported capitalism since it's since it began, like John Locke and both liberalism and neoliberal. Yeah, liberalism? yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So we're using it in kind of a bigger sense than. So when people refer to themselves as classical liberals, it's sort of like pro-capitalist. Exactly, okay. exactly. They don't mean Nancy Pelosi. Got you. Um, okay. And in fact, when you use the word liberal that way, Donald Trump and Joe Biden are both liberals. Yeah. Because they're both pro-capitalist. You know, mm -hmm. like I know that sounds weird, but just just to keep the the words right. So yeah, it's it's uh, you know it's a system um, based on you know privatization of things on market principle. But I actually think more than that, um, it's really a form of control, of political control. I, I think of capitalism as more of a political thing than an economic thing. I think it uses economics. And I think this is especially true with neoliberalism because I think that in the older days when when capitalists would, or when, when you know economic logic was used to sort of run things, they kind of meant it, like they did want to have profit and stuff like that. I think li neoliberalism is different, that it's that it, even profit is put below the desire to render everyone as precarious as possible, I would say. So it's a very, it's a very violent system. It creates a lot of um, dislocation, it creates a lot of inequality, and um, it tends to, um, you know, uh, I don't think it's a conspiracy or anything. I, I just think it's the way it works. Um, so I think even people who are perfectly nice just it sort of has it works the way it works, you know, and um, it I think it tends to sort of soak money up into like the, the very rich, and then sometimes you get these political movements like the New Deal and stuff like that, which kind of kind of redistribute money a little bit, and then it sort of bides its time and it does it again. So hmm. it, 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 it wants it just wants to sort of amass money, and resources and power and political power. So. Um, so that's, I don't know if that helps to what, what capitalism is, but, uh, but neoliberalism I think is an extreme version of it. And for example, this school is being really buffeted by neoliberal forces right now. Um, you know, uh, to talk, talk locally for a minute, mm -hmm. um, the CSU system that we're in has $14 billion of money that they do not think has anything to do with the school itself. They, they, this is all money that they have to, um, take out loans and, and sell bonds and things like that. It's, it's like this weird sort of state capitalism because, you know, it's not a private corporation. It's a public university, but they, they put away a billion dollars a year. And yet they're firing 350 lecture faculty at our school because of poverty, yeah. which doesn't exist. So it's, it's fake. It's not even. So they're trying to put that money away, I'm assuming, to get interest income yeah, instead of pulling it out. Exactly. And, and to pay, you know, the chancellor a million dollars a year and all that kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's it's like it's run it's basically a private corporation with a side gig as a public university at this point okay which is terrible yeah um, and it's it's not really about market efficiency because they have the money they're just not using it they just want more money you know what I mean it's almost become like this I don't even they're like hoarding it is something. the CSU part of the government yeah it's it's a it's a publicly run uh, institution yeah. when I hear you say that or give that example it, it sort of makes me think about why I view capitalism as like such an enabler of freedom and individual sovereignty because then it, i think you know that means that there's an inefficiency in the market because a section or a segment of the government that's responsible for administering school and faculty and and academic freedom and uh, ha maintaining these academic institutions is being inefficient and because we live in this like amazing capitalist society mm. that means younger people or just people that have experience in education have the opportunity to capitalize on that inefficiency in the market and provide a solution that benefits um, the people that aren't being served by the segment of the government that's yeah. responsible for, yeah. for academics. I mean, what I what I was, I was I mean, what I would think about that is if you could actually have people, and this is why I'm an anarchist, like kind of you know, an, when anarchists get any kind of political power, the first thing they do is they organize into these local councils. They're both economic and political. Okay. Like work workplace councils, like it could be the students at SF State or it could be wherever your job is or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and they make all those decisions together. So there's no profit motive, for example. There's no, it's not about profit. It's just about how, how are we going to do this? How are we going to distribute these resources, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of what you're talking about. But um, I think without the profit motive, I think that changes everything. I think, I think the profit motive is, is problematic and it puts people into competition with each other as opposed to um, working together, I, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, okay, this, you're not gonna like this, but yeah. to me, this is why capitalism never works the way people say it should. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, for me, it's, it's, not, it's, it's as political as it is economic and the, it's not that the politics keeps messing up the econ economics. 
it's that the politics is is almost prior to the economics and um, it's it is inherently like a vacuum cleaner that sucks resources up into itself so it's never going to not do that i guess is, is what i would say um you know um I've, ha I've had these debates before with people where they thought like if capitalism really worked the way it's supposed to work it would be great you know and it was just like what you said and um and i think this is why some people speak of anarcho-libertarianism or anarcho-capitalists but to me that's not possible because anarchists are very very anti-capitalist mm -hmm. um but I, I see I, it's 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 interesting because the, the the reason that people say that is because I think the anarch the anarchist vision is is not dissimilar to the to to the libertarian one, it's just that the libertarian one includes the market and the anarchist one doesn't, and that makes a huge difference. Let let's sort of explore that example you gave with uh, I'm not sure if the word you used was council or you know like in, in an anarchist uh, society theoretically oh. people would like sort of segment themselves yeah, into yeah, like yeah. these yeah yeah and, and it's sort of like these communities where mm -hmm. they have like these community I don't know if they have managers or if like everyone collectively no managers right? okay. Yeah. Yeah. One of the one of the use cases or maybe value propositions of prof profit motive in contrast with that system in my mind is when there's a profit motive, a group of people who are the best, have the most expertise and can facilitate education in the most efficient way possible can just focus on that. Mm -hmm. And because there's a profit motive, they can take the profits they make from that enterprise and then outsource whatever needs they need to maintain that mm -hmm. academic uh, organization to others who specialize. And therein lies the increase in inefficiency that capitalism provides. Mm. And why if, in my mind, if we lived in a theoretical uh, environment where there was sort of like these communities and they all uh, made decisions uh, collectively and in unison, mm -hmm. it would increase this inefficiency like exponentially. Mm. And that's why I sort of think that capitalism sort of needs to fit into this puzzle mm. and why I'm uh, much more optimistic about profit motive. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is um, one of the things I study is the Spanish anarchists who uh, in the 1930s, they had, they called the Spanish Civil War, but uh, anarchists called the Spanish Revolution because mm -hmm. it was actually a huge anarchist revolution until the fascists killed everybody. And um, actually, it's interesting. They, what they did is um, anarchists don't tend to have a one size fits all model. So they they would um, voluntarily collectivize a lot of workplaces. What does that mean, voluntarily? In other words, usually when the when communists come in, they just force everybody to they just like end capitalism overnight, and that's it. You know, then they just okay. collectivize everything. The anarchist model is different. It's 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 they don't force anybody to do anything. They set up these anarchist workplaces with the idea that workers aren't going to want to work for somebody who's ripping them off, and they rather work in you know for themselves. Yeah. Having said that, some of them did keep a money economy, which is to say. I'm not sure if profit motive is exactly the thing, but and anyway, they, they, they kept that. Others didn't. And it's, re it's just very interesting that they allowed this kind of diversity, different places. Some places did barter, some places did, you know, nothing. I don't know. You know, they, they all tried different things. And, and, and I, th I think that's great. You know, so I don't think there'd be zero place for that kind of, of activity in the way I'm thinking. And, and mm -hmm. in practice, that happens. But um, the problem with profit if I could get a little Marxist yeah. even, is that you are taking it from somebody. You know, you are like, um, you know, I, I, used to, I used to teach uh, political economy all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my favorite political economists was this guy, um, David Ricardo, who was an English political economist. And he and Marx agree on everything, except that Ricardo thinks it's good and Marx thinks it's bad. Because Ricardo said, you have to, the, you can't pay a worker what the value they produce for you. If you do that, you're not gonna, there is not gonna be any profit. Like in other words, if you work at a store and you make, I don't know, like like tables, okay, and you make like ten dollars worth of tables an hour, I can't give you ten dollars an hour because if I give you ten dollars an hour, then I'm just giving you all the value that you've made. So for yeah. me to get a profit, I have to pay you eight dollars or seven dollars. I think that assumes $5. that yeah. I'm producing ten dollars worth of value though, and yeah. it discounts the the value and the right the original creator of the enterprise has to profits because they were the ones that had to save up the money to take the courage in order to buy the original source materials, That's true. figure out the process of building yes. the table, make it as productive as possible, make the marketing yes. and distribution. But isn't it possible for a group of people to do the same thing? And I mean, let me tell you, let me, add, mm -hmm. let me follow that up. I do this all the time with my students and sometimes they give dancers I don't want them to give, but sometimes they do. Yeah. I always ask them, cause they all work, you know, cause we have, we're a working class university. And I always ask them, what would happen if you got rid of all your managers? Sometimes they are managers and it gets a little bit weird, but okay. I said, what if you got rid of all your bosses and managers could, wherever you're working? Mm -hmm. would, would that dramatically affect the, you know, the outcome of your work? 
And the majority of them say actually it would be better without them. Some of them say it would be worse. So I have to be honest with you. But the majority of say that would be better because usually, think of it this way, this is how I like to think about it. When you have all the workers, collectively, they know everything there is to know about that company, right? Mm -hmm. A manager or even a boss only knows what they know. And so if you give workers a chance to sort of share their knowledge, they know way more than any one person could know, if, if, you, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so the things that you're talking about, the courage and the investment, that can happen collectively. It doesn't only have to happen on the individual level. And so then everybody can kind of, you know, pay themselves, I guess you could say, for that collective skill, rather than just sort of having it concentrate in one or two people. Because I think that's the problem with capitalism is that it, it's a little bit arbitrary, I find, and maybe you'll agree with this, that in practice, not in theory, but in practice, it's not really always the best person that it rises to the top. It's often people who, you know, maybe their parents were rich or they got these breaks or whatever. You know, I think it depends how you define best person. Yeah, maybe that's the right. Maybe that's right. Um, but, but, you know, there's all kinds of weird things that happen along the way that, you know, um, and, you know, um, somebody, I, I don't know anything about this. I'm going to say this, but I, I'm mm -hmm. ignorant about this. But uh, people are like telling me Elon Musk is a total fraud because he's never actually started something from beginning to end. Like he took over Tesla when it was already really good. I don't know. I don't know anything myself. So mm -hmm. you might have different information. I've just been told this a few times. Yeah. Or he doesn't know anything about SpaceX. And actually with Twitter, he's completely running it into the ground. You know, he's just a, he's just, he's, he's bold and badass, but he's not, he actually isn't good at what he think what he says he's good at. Mm -hmm. He's not like this genius that started everything. I'm not saying that there aren't like amazing geniuses once in a while, you know, like Steve Jobs or something like that. Um, yeah. But um, a lot of these people are just brutes who like throw their weight around and sort of take over and aren't really good, like for what they do. I think I disagree <laughs> with that premise, and the, this is the reason why. And I've heard. Uh, I don't know what the name of the word is, but people that study uh, other animals like chimpanzees and the way they organize mm -hmm. themselves. What I've heard from them is the brutes are the ones that get killed when they're weak and others group up and like kill the brute. Mm -hmm. And the people that actually rise to the top are the people that are effective leaders. And it doesn't make much sense to me to think of the individuals who have been able to amass the most amount of wealth as doing so by being brutes, running people over. Mm. Because when we think about the types of people that get teared down right away, mm -hmm. even just in our personal lives and the people whose reputations are tarnished and the people we don't want around and don't yeah. want to offer opportunity to and collaborate, yeah. it's the individuals who don't treat others with respect. It's the individuals that can't bring people together. If there was one thing that I would guess is a common trait among most of the self-made billionaires, mm -hmm. not all the self-made billionaires, is that they have the ability to get people together to work on interesting problems, especially when you think about a startup environment where a lot of the times you have to convince people to come work for you mm. and it's a risk. They're quitting maybe jobs where they're being paid $500,000 million mm -hmm. comp packages because they're valuable. Yeah. And you have to be such a compassionate and, um, I don't know if attractive is the right word. It's probably a better word to use. Mm -hmm. But you have to be su you have to offer such an attractive opportunity and vision to these individuals yeah. to have them quit their jobs and work yeah. for you and yeah, take yeah. all that yeah. risk. You know? Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't know enough of the cases to sort of argue that. I will say I, this is maybe um, like in high school, all the bullies they never end up being anything. Like this is a good thing to know if you're in high school and you're being bullied. Those people are not going to end up. It's the nerds who become like the, the these entrepreneurs and stuff. But you know, I um I think I think of course there are some people who are like amazing and they do great things. But I don't think um, in a funny way I don't think capitalism um, always gets always allows the that that group to rise to the top. I think there's so many conflict because it's it's very political. It's not just economic, and there's so many things that get in the way of that. Um, you know, um, I, I, you know, and this is something that anarchists talk about all the time. Is there such a thing as a natural leader? You know, like because in the anarchist revolution, there isn't a such is, thing. Is there? Is oh, there, is there? Is there mm -hmm. such a thing? You know, um, mostly they want to say no. There, there, that, that shouldn't, that isn't a thing. But in practice, you know, there have been like anarchist leaders. Like in the Spanish Revolution, there were definitely people that rose up and and did were amazing and were amazing public speakers and you know moved people and did stuff. And and these were like common people. You know, like these. So when you have you know, one, one of the problems with capitalism is if you go, yeah, if you go to Harvard, Yale or Princeton, you know, you got it made. And if you go somewhere else, you, you know, there's a lot, there's a big waste of human talent going on in the world right now because people aren't able to get, you know, the education that they need or the opportunities that they need for all kinds of reasons, class, race, whatever. Um, but um, 
so one thing that anarchism is good at is people find out, oh my God, I'm really good at this because like I never had a chance before, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you, you do you do get a much more diverse group of people like kind of coming into their talents and stuff. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think even then for anarchists, it's always been a problem because um, anarchists talk about two political diseases. One is called leaderism and one is called followerism. Mm -hmm. And leaderism is where leaders think that they're they, they come to think that they're better than everybody else. And, you know, it, it kind of happens because they're getting like, they're getting, uh, they have all these yes people like, yes, you're so amazing. You know, like, you know, as you become more important, you get more flattered and blah, blah, blah. And then you, and then, and you start to make common cause with, um, you know, adversaries and, and you kind of sell out your people ultimately. That's what happened in the Spanish revolution, by the way, they had this, they had this union, this big anarchist union that coordinated all these collectivized things I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And they were terrified that it was going to sell out the, 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 the movement itself, and it did. Huh. They tried everything they could to not let that happen. They, yeah. the, the people weren't paid. There was no anyway, – it's, it's lots of things they did, but it didn't work. They sold them out. And so that was – and followerism is the opposite disease. It's where people want to have a leader, and they want to mm. be told what to do. That's, those, those are two terrible political diseases, and I think – what an example of followerism is sort of a lot of the political indifference uh, present in young people that yes, don't want to be politically 100%. active. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, ah, whatever, you know, it's not my problem or, you know, exactly. It's, it's, it's bad. It's, it, apathy, political apathy is a terrible thing, but I think it comes, to me it makes sense to be apathetic in a way. Not that I, I don't like it, but it makes sense because if you genuinely don't have a chance to have your own political voice heard, then, you know, why bother? I, 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 there's a book I love that came out recently. It's called The Dawn of Everything. If you want to read, it's 850 mm -hmm. pages long, so I don't know if you want to read it. But it's really good. And one of the things that they said was um, The Dawn of Reason. The Dawn of Everything. Everything, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things that the authors said was that when the uh, French uh, explorers came to North America and they were these priests and they learned these indigenous languages so they could convert people to Christianity, mm -hmm. but they learned the languages and they were really impressed because. Um, they noticed that everybody in these communities spoke beautifully, like they had really beautiful, very eloquent speech. Hmm. And they noted in France on my, on the, you know, this is a long time ago, but that, you know, that poor people spoke very kind of like truncated, like not very beautiful French, just like, it was just like, rah, 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 you know, just like very practical. And whereas rich people spoke beautiful, elegant French. And, and what they realized was it was meaning like they'd use really descriptive words yes, and finish yes, their sentences yes. in the a way, really elegant the, way. Their language was totally different. It was one was very poetic oh. and wonderful, and one was just like very flat. And what they what they what they realized was it was because these communities were very collective, so that everybody, man, women, and child, was able to speak and had their voice heard in these collective councils, and they and they would actually be listened to, and they would make decisions together, so that they so that they bothered to learn the language of persuasion and beautiful speech. Like mm -hmm. it was it was worth it for them, so that they all learned it. Whereas in France, they, there was no point if you were poor. And so the analogy I'm making is like when young people are like, ah, screw politics. It's like, why bother? Like, why bother like learning these skills or knowing what I'm capable of or what it would be like if I had political authority and power since there's no way I'm ever going to get it, you know? And yeah. I, I find that depressing and sad. Yeah, um, I was listening to a podcast <laughs> earlier and um, I'm not sure if you've heard of Jordan Peterson before. I, I've heard of him, yes. But he was... Um, he was talking about naivety, cynicism, and then uh, cur courage. And he was talking about how there's sort of like this process individuals undergo. And some people finish the process, and some, some people don't. And it starts with the naivety. You know, you're a child, um, and you're living in bliss because of your naivety. Mm -hmm. And then when you're naive, the problem is is you're operating under the assumption that there isn't a presence of like male malevolence in the world, right? Yeah. And eventually, you might have an experience where you met with that malevolence mm -hmm. and something traumatic happens. Mm -hmm. And that sort of brings in uh, this sort of like cynical app the aptitude aptitude uh, maybe At cynical, attitude maybe cynical attitude yeah. about uh, about the world and although mm. he and i along with him believe cynicism it's bad it's still better than naivety mm. yeah but then yeah. You, there's a lot of people get sort of caught in this trap of cynicism and i think a lot of like political apathy is rooted in, in, in cynicism about the power and impact one can have but once you're cynical you're, you're sort of met with a these like two uh, streets you could walk down. One mm -hmm. is to continue being cynical, mm -hmm. and it sort of leads to like a bitter, um, sad, sort of like powerless life. Mm -hmm. And the other one is to be courageous and have faith that it is possible for optimism to exist mm -hmm. while realizing that there is malevolence in the world. Mm -hmm. But if anything, it's like you have the opportunity to be benevolent, and if you want to live uh, as fulfilling a life as possible and ascribe meaning to your life, yeah. then taking the path of like, 
uh, behaving in a way that um, sort of like views benevolence and um, ethical behavior yeah. and excellence as an ideal is sort of the best way to move forward. Mm. And I think that it, it, that sort of like commentary may, may describe a lot of like my skepticism or maybe the sort of the arguments I have with other people my age that are politically apathetic mm. or maybe just apathetic about life in general. Mm -hmm. They sort of feel very powerless. Yeah. And I wonder how much that it can be attributed to maybe the, the way educators have communicated to them as they grew up, mm. maybe the, the way their parents have yeah. uh, communicated to them or their, maybe projected their beliefs about them to them. Yeah. And to me, it's like, it's so important, especially right now, like there's so much you can do. You have yeah. no idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I always love questioning and expressing skepticism mm -hmm. of their assumption that they are powerless and they can't have an impact. Yes, no, I, I actually agree. I, I'm, I'm supposed to hate Jordan Peterson. I've never listened to him, but I, but I do but I do like what you said. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I um, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's I think that's right. I think um, you know uh, it can become self defeating, obviously, and um, you know um, and you know what I try to do with my students every semester, which is really great, is I try to give them a little taste of their own power. Hmm. Um, so I'll do stuff like um, you know I'll, I'll like for example, I had these students uh, they were going to give an oral report, um, and I said, okay, but I'm going to let you decide what you're going to do and how you're going to be graded and everything. Okay. And they decided, and I love this, that everyone in the class who, who was going to get an A, even if they didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, we talked about it a long, a long time, and they said, you know, that taking that, 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 um, that competition and, that, uh, and also the anxiety about what grade you're going to get away, and they did a beautiful job, by the way. The oral report was amazing. And there were people who didn't do anything and they got an A. You know, mm -hmm. so they, 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 were, they, were, they were true to it. But they, and I didn't coach them to do this, you know. But they, um, I know this is a very small thing, but it, they were so excited to have a little bit of power, you know, because when you're a student, you don't get that power. You know, grading is a thing that you, you know, that mm -hmm. the faculty have. Yeah. But when you when you give it back, and they did that, and it was so, I was so touched by it because they, they were sort of recognizing that some some of their fellow students just weren't, you know, weren't, weren't going to do it. Yeah. And they didn't want to punish them, and they didn't want to be competitive. Um, and they were so excited. I, it's hard. I can't even describe to you how I do this all the time. I mean, so. I can see it. You yeah, see yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just great, you know. And I think I, I, I think um, there's a, there's a concept in anarchism called direct action, which is reminds you a little bit of what you were just saying. Um, direct action. Yeah. Okay. So so unlike um, so there's people like you know Henry David Thoreau, for example, or Mahatma Gandhi, who are like civil disobedient. They, they Who's were, Henry David? Henry David Thoreau. He was like this. Um, he was like this writer from the 19th century. Okay. And he lived in a shack by himself. He wrote a book called Walden. Walden? Walden yeah, on Walden Pond. I can't remember what it's okay. called now. Cool. Um, anyway, um, and his whole thing, and this is not, this is not direct action. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a distinction. Uh, people that do civil disobedience break the law because they don't think the law is fair. So, for example, he was protesting a tax, so he went to jail because he mm -hmm. wouldn't pay it. Uh, he, the tax was for the Mexican-American War. He didn't think it was fair to to steal half of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So he went to jail because he wouldn't pay his, t his taxes, right? And so that's a, that's, that's a, um, with, that is sort of within liberalism because you're saying, I don't like that law, but I'm willing to suffer the consequences of having broken it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, still, I still am within this society, you know? I, I think that's great. I'm not against it, but direct civil action- Civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. Okay. But gotcha. I think direct action is even better. Okay. Because direct action says, um, I'm going to create a world in which I want it the way I want it to be, the way it should be, you know, like an anarchist world. I'm going to live as if we already lived under conditions of anarchism, and I will not accept being arrested. I will fight back. I will, I will, you know, like it's, it's, I, I reject entirely the right of the state to put me in jail for expressing my, uh, my beliefs or, mm -hmm. or so on and so forth. So it, it's, it's, it, and so, so a lot of it just comes down to like, you know, actually in Europe they have these anarchist neighborhoods. Um, there's one in Athens, there's one in Copenhagen. I think the one in Copenhagen is now just basically a bunch of drug dealers, so it's completely lost its political side. But in, in Athens, I think they still have it. And they kind of just live as if they, they live in an anarchist universe and the police don't come there. They know better because they get messed with and they have fights and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so they just kind of leave it alone. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's, it's, 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 it's a little bit of what you're saying. Like you, you don't have to just um, be cynical and depressed and you know <laughs> down you can there's actually there's some there's things you can do but there's but i was just sort of giving you different options yeah. like you can you can you can disobey the law but then suffer the consequences willingly or you can disobey the law and not suffer the consequences willingly you know that that the, the latter is the more radical anarchist position the other is the more 
amenable with with uh, liberalism uh, the way you and I understand that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really dynamic approach, and I think there's a part of that that sounds really exciting, but I think there's also a part that I'm skeptical of, and that is, how do you know? Why are you so sure that this belief that you have is correct? Mm, yes. Yes. And if you're going to like, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't remember what what the name of the individual was that went to jail for for uh, Thoreau. not paying taxes. Thoreau. Yeah. But it's like, man, if you're gonna make a life altering, almost like throwing your life away, mm -hmm. s uh, sort of decision. Yeah. You better be right. <laughs> wherein lies your sort of like skepticism and self evaluation, maybe your lack of understanding, where your different perspective is. And then another note is, and this has sort of been uh, how to, my approach to to politics has sort of um, evolved since mm -hmm. I was younger. I sort of view as like, I'm really interested in politics. I wanna have as much of what I view a, a positive impact as possible. Mm -hmm. And the way I do that isn't by protesting per se, it's by accumulating power, wealth, and influence mm -hmm. and operating under the, the system that I was like sort of born into. Mm -hmm. And then therein lies sort of like the pathway for me to actually make a material difference mm -hmm. in the world. Rather than it, it seems like you know there's like sort of like these lazy routes and uh, much more difficult yeah. critical routes that people yeah. can undergo, yeah. and a lot of those um, just to be honest, a lot of those like sort of examples of individuals that just go to jail mm -hmm. come across to me as like maybe that was the path of least resistance <laughs> out of like the breadth of yeah. paths of resistance you could have undertaken. Yeah. I mean, I guess the idea there is to uh, impress other people. Like, oh my God, he went to jail. That 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 tax must be messed up. You know, that kind of yeah. thing. But which 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 leads me to. I mean, I don't know if it's exactly a response to what you just said, but I think it is. To me, I think it's very important that you don't just do it by yourself, but you do it with other people because and and you know one of the stereotypes of anarchism is that it's chaotic and uh, like individualistic. And I think it's 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 in practice it isn't. It's actually very organized. It's just mm -hmm. collective organization, right? And um, it, and it's it's individualistic in some way, but individuals in this collective, because I think that helps keep you from doing like foolish things, you know? Like, what, you know, um, so that you all talk together and you make decisions together. And I think collective decisions are tend to be better than individual decisions on the whole. Like you have to, you know, you have to kind of work it out and talk and do things. Um, it kind of, it, it keeps you from throwing your life away or, or mm -hmm. doing something, you know, dying on a hill that you sh that is just dumb. Like it, it, you need you need, it, no one by themselves is going to make great decisions. I think it's always good to have like check in with others with your with your comrades and peers and you know. And I think I think the more you can think as a group, the the more the better your decisions will be um, to some extent. I, but that that's a big issue with anarchism is like. Um, there's 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 fights inside of anarchism like just mm -hmm. anybody does whatever the hell they want or is it more this more organized thing you know um, and in practice it's always been the organized uh, way that that by, by definition like individuals are never going to start an anarchist movement mm -hmm. they're just going to do their thing and that's it you know I think there that that's an interesting assumption that I I think I heard you make earlier of um that decisions can more effectively be made by the collective and yeah. not by individuals yeah. Because one thing I've sort of thought about is if we evaluate sort of like the environment that we as human beings have to live within, right? Mm -hmm. There's like intelligence quotient, it's distributed anomaly, there's mm -hmm. people in the bottom 50%, there's people in the top 50%, and then there's these, all these other factors and like the big five personality traits that sort of affect how productive and competent you can be. And then there's sort of personal decisions you make, whether you're courageous to undertake certain pursuits that are much more challenging yeah. and can have a positive impact on you and yeah. your competence. And uh, on the contrary, maybe pursuits that are uh, n have a much higher probability of success, but maybe not much of uh, value or personal development mm -hmm. uh, potential. And it's an interesting thing to think about, like does consolidating power um, lead to better, more holistic, innovative um, leadership? Mm -hmm. And then if we think about the like consolidation of power as a spectrum, right being dictator, yeah. left being everyone has the equal amount of influence and power. Right wherein lies that sort of like gray area or just sort of field where we can feel pretty confident yeah. that there'll be effective decision making yeah. happening. Yeah. And uh, it isn't too much to the left or too much to the right on yeah. that spectrum. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a really good concrete example uh, to sort of promote my, my position, which is, um, and, you know, I, I think, like I said earlier, I think um, no one by themselves knows a lot, but everyone knows everything you know like when, the more people you include the more knowledge you get and this became very demonstrated to me very candidly uh, graphically 
um, this summer because um, you know our, uh, so I'm, I, I was the chapter president of our of our faculty union here okay. just just of this chapter there's 23 chapters and there's a whole system and we fought like hell to get this thing called open bargaining we fought our, our union leadership in Sacramento um, which what's was, open bargaining op so open bargaining means that um, instead of just having a small bargaining team meet with the administration's team and they make decisions together and that's it and you have no idea what's going on and a bargaining team advocates for the members of the union. yeah like we're trying okay. to get a new contract so we're, we're asking for this they ask for that you know we have a big mm -hmm. argument blah, blah blah yeah but normally that happens in secret behind closed doors we have no idea what happens you mm -hmm. know so open bargaining is when any member can participate in that process interesting and after a very long battle where they fought us tooth and nail they finally gave in and and accepted open bargaining this summer and they were, and I have to give them credit. They went for it big time. I thought they were just going to have a thing where we'd be on Zoom, but we couldn't say anything or couldn't. There would be no chat. But it, actually, we were all physically with them in the room, and they included us on the bargaining team, so that we were all part of the bargaining team. So like when the, when they would make a proposal, they would leave, and then we would all talk amongst ourselves. It was amazing, and this had a huge impact on the the quality of both of our resolve and on the decisions that we made. Right, for, and I'll give you a few examples. Like um, so. The bargaining team normally was just about five or six people, right? And mm -hmm. they were still, of course, because they were still the bargaining team. You know, they, they, I mean, even though they said we were all the bargaining team, they, they ultimately made all the final decisions. But, um, but having us in the room with them did a lot of things. Um, for, for just on a very small level, first of all, it, it, it gave them a much more backbone because in the past they've crumbled. This is leaderism, right? They make common cause with others. Even though they hate the other side, they're like, they get worn down or whatever, you know, it's just five people. So there's like strength in numbers. Exactly, people, exactly. Right? So they, exactly. So they got one bad contract after another, which is why this time they would not back down on anything because we were all there with them. So we gave them incredible militancy and resolve, right? Because mm -hmm. what we're asking for is actually very reasonable. We're just asking for like to be and just for inflation, <laughs> you know, so we get the, the money that we used to get. So we, instead of less money. Um, uh, so that was one thing. But also, and this is, I thought this was so interesting. There were like 150 people, you know, they, by the way, we totally freaked out the administration side. They were like, are all these people always going to be here? And they were said, well, it might be 30,000 people next time because there's 30,000 members in this union. So um, that's mm -hmm. what that was amazing. But like, for example, one of the things they were talking about was having um, um, trans friendly bathrooms in every building at every campus. So like we have w two in this building, but not in other buildings, you know, and some students can, you know, it's really a big deal about where they go to the bathroom. It's trans friendly, just like gender neutral. Gender neutral, yeah, okay. gender neutral. Yeah. yeah, that's a better word. Um, so, and they had people in the room who knew how much that costs and stuff. So like they were able to sort of inform our bargaining team who knew nothing about this practically what was being asked for and stuff so that they could make a much more intelligent ask. Mm -hmm. And this was also true with, um, we want um, lactation rooms for nursing parents because right now you, if you're a nursing parent, a faculty and, and student, you have to go to the bathroom, which is gross. Yeah. Like you have to feed your baby in the toilet. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that, that's that's crazy. gross, right? So anyway, so then we, they were like, well, what should we ask for? And they, were, and they were like, well, I'm a nursing parent. Let me tell you what we should, you know? So, I mean, that's what I mean. Like that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been there. Mm -hmm. And we were able, and, and they were taking us seriously. So they were really listening to us, and we knew stuff that they didn't know, mm -hmm. and they couldn't have known because there weren't enough of them. So you see what I mean? Yeah. So we made a much wiser, much more informed, and much more concrete set of proposals than they could have by themselves. Yeah. Does that make sense? So really, that's what exactly what I'm talking about. Like it felt very anarchist in a way. Like we were like we they didn't want it at first because it was they lost a lot of power. You know, they got to make all the shots, but actually they got a lot more power in the end. They yeah. got our collective power instead of their individual power. And they've been much, and that's why we're going on strike next week. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone on strike in 12 years because they always go like, okay, we'll just take your stupid offer. You know, mm -hmm. this time they were like, and it was, it was beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah. It's a cool story. But yeah. I think when I listen to that story, what it resembles, at least conceptually in my mind is the attempt our founding fathers made in constructing our government. Because hearing you say, having like making sure as best as we can make sure everyone's perspective is being heard mm -hmm. and that sort of gathering of the perspective yeah. is sort of like the driving force of a much more comprehensive and effective proposal mm -hmm. from the the leaders front. Yeah. that sort of seems like what the founding fathers were sort of attempting to do and why i'm much more optimistic about sort of like capitalism and the way the u.s is set up than maybe others might be because it seems like okay that's sort of what the idea was with having the three branches of government mm -hmm. and then you have state representatives you have yeah. state government and then they they relay information from their constituents and it, there's sort of like this tier system yeah. that yeah. goes all the way up to the senate 
Congress president, yeah. and then you sort of like force these groups of people to collaborate, yeah. and in a sense gather more information. And obviously, you know, there's uh, inefficiencies, there's yeah. things that go wrong, there's corporate influence, there's yeah. lobbying, there's revolving doors, yes, yes, regulatory yes. capture. Yes, the, yeah. the the whole thing, and maybe that's more indicative of like our imperfection as human beings, and maybe the system would work if yeah. we didn't have all these like yes, uh, more of like maleficent or uh, right, right. Poor, poorly intentioned motivations. Yeah. Well, you know, I I have two I have two thoughts about that because it's a very good point. Um, one is that had everybody been able to participate in that those conventions rather than just like the, these these particular leaders, we couldn't have had slavery, for example. If we had all all these black people there, they'd be like, "Should we have slavery?" They would have been like, "Uh, uh-uh. mm-hmm. right." So it would have been impossible to do a lot of the bad things that they did, and a lot of and that cre- that created a huge distortion in the U.S. Republic, and which is we're still suffering from today. So it was it would have been much better to get rid of it from the get go, you know, and not have it. Um, that's one thing. But also, and I, I, this is probably a controversial point, but I actually think the original um, Articles of Conf- Confederation that preceded the U.S. Constitution were better than the Constitution. Okay. Yeah, I'm not so familiar with well, the original. The, the, I'll tell you what it was, and then I'll tell you what was bad without it. Okay. And you can decide what you think is better. Yeah, for sure. So the, it was a much more, uh, not anarchist, but it was much more local politics so that mm-hmm. any, any po- so instead of making 13 states with one federal government that really dominated, it was like... Um, the states were all could all veto things, and they all like had a much more local power. And even within the states, they had more local power. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and and the biggest thing was that um, representatives had to actually represent. And this is and and they call this um, they didn't call them representatives. They called them manda- mandatories. And what that meant was so like you vote. I don't know who you voted for. Let's just pretend you, we both voted for Nancy Pelosi. I've never been able oh, to vote. For okay, it. Yeah. okay. Well, this is my first time okay, okay. next year. So let's just. Oh, I'm just picking Nancy Pelosi because she's mm-hmm. San Francisco. Anyway, yeah. Um, so you vote for Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. It's true that if you that if she did a bunch of stuff that we hate, we could vote her out of office eventually. Although in practice, that's very complicated. But effectively, Nancy Pelosi never called either of us and asked us anything. Right? Mm-hmm. The way mandatory systems work is. A col- you have this meeting here in San Francisco and everybody in San Francisco would get to go to the meeting and they would say, what does Nancy Pelosi get to say in Washington? And we mm. would tell her what to say. She couldn't say anything different. And the second she started to mess with that, we could we could get rid of her immediately just for that. It's, it's a, in other but, words, so they, there could be like a vote called at any moment. Is that? Yes. Sort of like the, yes. You could okay. recall any ma- any moment for, for, for not doing. So she's not really she's just like a mouthpiece for us. Mm-hmm. You see, so it's much more democratic in that sense. Like. And, and and think of it this way, the I don't know how, how many five or six hundred people are in Congress, like four hundred representatives and a hundred senators, something like that. Let's say roughly five hundred people or five hundred eighty people or something. Those people are free and democratic because they get to do their thing. Yeah. And they get to kind of come up with whatever they want. They have enormous political. They have a beautiful political life. Mm-hmm. But but but. They don't, but we don't get to have one because they get to have one. In other words, they have one instead of us having one. But if we could, if we could do the system that they had in the past, where we would decide what they could say, it's a much, sl- you know, it's slower, it's more funky. Mm-hmm. Um, then we would get to have that political life. Yeah. Like we would get to meeting. We would be like Nancy Pelosi. You can say this, and you don't get to say that. That's it. Mm-hmm. You have to come back to us if there's something. You know, so there's a lot of it was. A, it was a huge pain in the ass. It would be yeah. easier today with electronics. You know, Zoom and stuff. Yeah, that that's a that's a really cool explanation. And I think one of the things that that sort of like answer um, made me think about was maybe we have a different um, view on what we want the nature of our political influence to look like. Yeah. Because when I think about what I would like my nature, the nature of my political influ- influence to look like, I think. When I'm voting for someone, I'm not voting for them to. Uh, I'm not voting for them to have like an exact value alignment with me. Mm-hmm. I'm more so just voting for like the most competent individual that I think is well intentioned. Yeah. And then sort of like sending them off to problem solve. Yeah. Not so much like I want them to have perfect value alignment with yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. And then if there are certain issues like let's say legalization of marijuana or mm-hmm. just other issues that make sense to call a vote for. Yeah. Then to call a vote for it and then yeah. have an election, then yeah. people can vote for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's undoubtedly true that people develop, and this is one of the issues with, um, like, term limits, for example, that people, Terminal. term limits, like, term, oh, okay. yeah, you know, like you can you, you can yeah. only be in Congress for X number of years. I, I don't think they're allowed to put them on states on federal ones, but you can definitely do it on state ones. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the problem with that is those people do amass a lot of knowledge, but you know, my my counter argument to that is that. Um, that prevents us from amassing knowledge. Like we're like, oh well, Nancy Pelosi is going to take care of that. Like I don't have to know anything about anything, and you know that's what I was saying before. Like she can't possibly know enough as much as we could all know. So like, you know, when you have everyone's perspective in the room, 
I know that she probably comes and asks people questions. I'm not sure, but you know, it's 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 very interesting when you actually get people to actually speak um, what they know. Like we we've been trying to work with the students and the staff and the faculty all together to sort of talk about our common problems, and it's amazing when you get everybody in the room. Like you know everything. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way like the president of this university could know what we all know. You know, and I, I think the same thing. Like Nancy Pelosi, no, she could be like a genius beyond genius. I'm not. I don't know if she is or isn't, but. Um, she she still can't know everything there is to know and so that keeps that piece of it out of politics i guess but i i see what you mean like if if we we're going to stay with our system i would agree with you mm -hmm. yes like you, you it's not about your personal preference it's about like how competent do they seem and that kind of stuff right because because it, it's a very tough job you have a big learning curve you know so my feeling is if you're going to have like a liberal democracy like we have don't have term limits let people like do their thing you know um but if you want to have a much more effective and much, in a funny way, much smarter system, then you should kind of let everybody in on it. Now, I'll tell you what was bad about the Articles of Confederation and why they got rid of it. Mm -hmm. It was it was um, unable to stamp out rebellions because it, it created a lot of rebellions because people are like, ah, oh, screw that. And um, Massachusetts had a rebellion. Um, these farmers just stopped, didn't want to pay taxes anymore. And they mm -hmm. just and and Massachusetts didn't have enough money to put them down, and it took a lot. You know, it was a whole. So that was a crisis that led them to say, "Let's we need a much stronger centralized federal system." But you know, each each one has its pros and cons, right? Like what the, was beautiful about the old system was it was incredibly democratic, mm -hmm. except it wasn't because it had slavery and stuff. But you know, if it, it had it had it been even more anarchist, it would have it wouldn't have had that either. Um, but the what replaced it was more efficient. And much abler to stamp out local problems, you know. But what you gave up was all of all of that collective knowledge and a lot of freedom, right? Um, that people had to express themselves and do things. Um, so you know, it's, it was a trade-off, but it yeah. was a trade-off I would have made. Like, no, yeah, I really, I yeah. really do see what you're saying, and I yeah. do think maybe most of our like political differences lie in just that trade-off we'd make. Because for me, it's like I'd rather make that take that more efficient approach. And then have myself focus on like all the problems I want to solve. Right, 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 uh, right. Yeah. Aside from politics. Yes, yes. Um, yes. One thing that comes to mind though is I, I heard you mention um, the importance of like concept uh, theoretically speaking, you know, Nancy Pelosi, if she was coming here and having more conversations with more people, she, there's so much for, more for her to, to learn here yes. instead of in Washington D.C. Yeah. And one of the things that is sort of like a part of the calculus of how I um, determine, at least from my vantage point, how competent a person that's running for office or is in office is, is their ability to um, paint an accurate picture and sort of like build or undergo like an accurate assessment of what it is people are struggling with mm -hmm. and what it is people uh, would like them to consider mm -hmm. and what yeah. are some ideas that people are interested in. Right. And to me, I sort of view that as like part of their sort of like competence tool skit or competence score yes, yes. and not so much something that may need to be uh, sort of like for, forced behavior into like our, maybe the legal framework that yeah. sort of like forces politicians to yeah. go and speak with people. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, again, it, it depends. Like if you, if I was gonna stick with the system that we have, I would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that is good. Um, but you know what, uh, what that often becomes in practice is a listening tour where like Hillary Clinton went all over the country and like, tell me all of your problems. You know, mm -hmm. she didn't give a crap about, you know, I mean, she was just doing it as a, as a kind of a PR stunt. Yeah. The difference between what the Articles of Confederation were like was that she didn't have any choice. She had, it wasn't that she had to listen to them. She could she be had, a recall. She had to do what they said. <laughs> she had to, you know what I mean? They had power over her. Yeah. When, 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 when Nancy Pelosi doesn't, all, you know, all she has to do is make sure that you vote for her, then a listening tour is a good temptation. And I, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't wonderful politicians who really do listen and really do learn from people. I, I think there are, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you, you get the luck of the draw. And I'm, you know, I, I, I think the, probably the majority of the, politicians because they have no time they're always re trying to get raise money for re-election they don't have time to do all that stuff so they just have to look like they're doing it mm -hmm. you know and that just it's not their fault even it's just the way it is but they they you know then then they're not really even they're just acting like they're listening so that you think they're so you'll vote for them yeah <laughs> and like look how much i listen to people and then they just do whatever they want um so uh, to me it's much better to force them to do what you i mean it's the opposite of what you just said it's better to make them do what you want them to do rather than have them come to you and you know listen to you because the because even though there are some amazing politicians in this world, there are who do that. Even so, they can't listen to everybody. You know, yeah. the mechanism just isn't there for them to listen to everybody. Um, and I think you know, at some point, they're gonna 
listen to themselves yeah. or their advisors or whoever, you know. Yeah. It's interesting. I Hearing you describe that sort of like framework where um, politicians are forced to uh, hear out the community, I really do find that very exciting. Yeah. But to me, it, it just seems like when I run that simulation in my head, it just seems too chaotic and too sort of like lacking in foundation to where if there is a conflict or if there's something really serious going yeah. on, it's like, what would a politician's uh, assessment of AI and like AI regulation look like mm -hmm. when they have a populace that may not be as informed because they have regular jobs and kids. And yes. is that a dealing with an issue or an emerging technology like that, yeah. would having a system that's as volatile as it seems like a system like that yeah. would be that's, what's optimal? You said a lot of really interesting things. I, I, I think a couple of things in what you just said. Um, one is I personally think anarchism is way more organized and less chaotic than what we have. Like our system is chaotic because random people like Nancy Pelosi have have all this power and you know for whatever reason she's from an old political family. You know she's not, she's not just didn't come out of nowhere. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I, to me that's chaotic. You have these people who are kind of randomly picked some some because they're great and some people for other reasons um, doing things. To me that's chaotic. Like it's just like and 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 um, the other thing I was going to say is. Um, uh, which is you didn't quite say, but I, I think it's implicit in what you said is uh, there's a great line by this um, Irish playwright Oscar Wilde who said the problem with socialism is I don't have enough free evenings. And mm. by that he meant he thought this like it's just sort of what you're saying about like working people knowing about AI, right? Mm -hmm. That um, th that, uh, you know, that we would spend all of our time having to have these boring meetings where we're talking, we're learning about AI and we don't have time to do anything, you know, and um, I think in practice, that is true. When you have no political or economic power, then all you're doing is talking, talking, talking. It just seems like this big bore. But in practice, when people have had actual real political power, they've done things overnight that are amazing. And a great example, I don't know if you've heard or studied this at all, is the Paris Commune, which was in 1870 no. in Paris. It's a long story I won't get into, but um, it, it, it was um, the, the workers of the city um, Fr France had just tried to uh, invade Germany and they totally, lo Prussia it was called then, and they totally lost. Mm -hmm. And so the Prussians ha had not, like, taken over, had kicked out, you know, they won and they were surrounded Paris and the workers of Paris picked that moment to rise up and create this three month long p political ex and economic experiment, you know. And in those three months, it was incredibly, it's just what I, what I love. It was all workers councils, everything, you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah. They all got murdered at the end, you know, as, as often happens. Yeah. But um, in that time, they did so much, so fast, so well. That mm -hmm. was the thing that was incredible. These working people, these are people who like, you know, smelters and bus drivers and whatever, you know, they were just people. Um, they, they figured out like how to completely transform themselves in three months. It's a very little short amount of time. They did more in three months than any of our presidents has ever done and they're all together in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it really is incredible how when you, it's a little bit like what I was saying with my students, like they get so excited when I give them these little tiny tastes of power. When you get a real taste of power, it's amazing, I think, what happens. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if that's sustainable forever. I think it's, it's got to kind of get old after a while. But I think we have so much pent up, unresolved political and economic thoughts that we just suppress because we're like, nobody's ever going to listen to me. I have no power. That all kind that all comes out, you know, and it's 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 kind of amazing. When, when I, I really hear you. Um, I do recognize that when people are empowered, they th great things can happen, mm -hmm. and a lot of political change can happen much faster than mm -hmm. it can because you don't real deal with a lot of the political constraints that yeah. our politicians and our system is sort of subjected to. But it, and if we sort of connect this to your example of the students in your classroom, uh -huh. right, where you sort of like removed the the you sort of gave, um, you removed the responsibility yeah. because there is no responsibility to get a grade. Everyone right. can get an A. Yeah. And it sort of like lifted this weight off the shoulders of the kids. And maybe, you know, th there's just sort of like this psychological inertia of like them not wanting to put in a ton of effort with their school because it's just really intimidating. Yeah. What if I get a bad grade? Right, right. When I do work, I'm putting a part of myself out there. Right. And if I get a bad grade, that's sort of reflective of my intrinsic value. Exactly. There's all these yeah, like yeah. sort of things interplaying. Yeah, yeah. But if I were sort of run that experiment on a long enough time scale in my head, I would guess that that would sort of, maybe there's like a, a spike in productivity in the beginning, mm -hmm. but then it sort of tapers off and over time it leads to dysfunction, irresponsibility, mm. since people don't want to be held accountable, nothing really gets done. And it maybe part of the value of responsibility and constraints is that it, it sort of emp maybe empowers people to adopt responsibility and work on their skill sets and do things that are hard and participate mm -hmm. in critical thinking mm. and, and do more of the grunt work 
than uh, taking the path of least resistance. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I agree. I mean, I think that experiment, if that was all it was, would, would eventually exactly the way you know. And, you know, part of it, the reason it works is because I don't tell them in advance. Mm -hmm. Like, like this is what I want you to do. Like, I let them, I let them come up with it, you know. Um, but I, I think that... Um, I, I think that, well, I don't know. I'm trying to map it. I think there would be definitely an initial explosion of creativity and stuff. I don't, I don't think it would go all the way down below, though, because I think, like I said, um, the beauty of having everybody involved is you have, like, rotation of people who are interested. You know, it's like sometimes these people, sometimes it's these people, and whatever, you know. Like, it, it's, it's much more um, reflective of the community as a whole and therefore less, like... I think what you're talking about happens more with individuals, you know, like, um, and this definitely happens with a lot of politicians. They're great at first, and then they, over time, they get kind of like lazy, you know, it's, it's, it's the same pattern, I guess. But I think if you have a whole group of people, I think they hold each other collectively responsible, if you have the ability to do that. So like our Nancy Pelosi example, mm -hmm. if she did that, like, she's great at first, and then she started, like, we, and if she got recalled, we were able to recall her, that mm -hmm. would be a very... That would be... Just, great motivator. Yes, yeah, so it would be a great motivator. So it's not like these systems don't have consequences and motivations they're just different if you will like yeah uh in, in you know in one system you're just um it's all about yourself and what you, you know what you do, do you have to be like disciplined how you have to be disciplined and this other way i'm talking is about collective discipline like you know like it, it's always kind of making assumptions it's, it's sort of making assessments about who is doing what and why and how and um it, it uh it's a diff it's just a different mode it's it's still it still has a lot of what you were talking about it still yeah. has like discipline and responsibility and consequences it just comes in a different way you know because yeah. i agree with you if you had nothing and no consequences of any kind i don't think that would be good mm -hmm. uh, i think that would be but, but that's the point is that or, or anarchism is organized it's just organized differently than cap than neo cap liberal capitalism whatever you want to call it um, I feel like we agree on 90% of the stuff, but just not on the capitalist part. But to me, that's a big deal. But but yeah. um, <laughs> um, but but uh, I think, uh, you know, that that to me, that's a kind of a um, I, I'm almost more against capitalism than I am against states, believe it or not. Um, oh, OK, but I think because states were created to to help capitalism out. So mm -hmm. I think they're kind of it's kind of the other way around. But um, I want to connect the classroom example to capitalism. Sure. And let's uh, imagine grades as power. Maybe just think about it as money, right? Mm -hmm. And grades are money. Mm -hmm. So it's like a currency that people yeah. are competing for, right? Yeah. In my view, there's certain people that make the decision to be courageous mm -hmm. and work on their competence and make amazing thing, things happen. And then there's always going to be people that are fine with being irresponsible. They're fine yeah. with making poor decisions. They're fine with... Uh, taking advantage of other people mm -hmm. uh you know there's always like a yep. distribution of like psychopaths and yeah, yeah, you know, great yeah. people you know yeah and when i think about what it is that i appreciate and love about capitalism is that capitalism offers this framework where you would want the people who are the most collaborative and the most innovation mm -hmm. to be allocated the most amount of uh resources yeah. and capital because they are the most effective allocators of capital mm -hmm. in order to produce more innovations and to reward the younger people that are also seemingly very competent and mm -hmm. motivated to make great things happen and provide them with capital. And when I think about, uh, let, let's take a per individual like Elon Musk or even just like VCs here in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. this is what like fundamentally makes me so excited about mm -hmm. being born in the Bay Area mm -hmm. and hopefully growing up and being a part of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. is that at one point, it seems like there's a cycle in Silicon Valley where there's like the 20 year olds mm -hmm. that are just these kids that want to make amazing things happen for the world and mm -hmm. contribute. Yeah. And then there's these like elders that at one point, 40, 30 years ago, were like startup founders. Yeah. Now amass this wealth. Yeah. And they have a ton of capital to allocate to the young people mm -hmm. wanting to like innovate and right. create amazing products for right. the world. And it sort of onsets this cycle where billion dollar corporations that offer so much jobs, money, they make things much more cheaper. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of this podcast equipment, the reason why it's so cheap for me is because Jeff Bezos created Amazon mm -hmm. and there's manufacturers competing for it to manufacture like a shore microphone yeah. or like a field recorder. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, when we think about like what maintains, even just from like a national security standpoint, the fact that the US is like the mecca of mm -hmm. like innovation and creating all these companies yeah. is so much of what uh, ensures like our national prosperity mm -hmm. and also generates like revenue that then we can reallocate yeah. to welfare states and then support more people to be a part of that sort of yeah. like ongoing cycle yeah. of innovation. Yeah. No, I think that's, I mean, I, I love your enthusiasm. I would never want to say anything bad about any of mm -hmm. that. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that I think that, um, you know, um, you know, often um, they want people contrast um, centralized planning, which is like the Soviet Union and then 
I don't know what we are, decentralized, not planning, which is capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. And I think of anarchism as decentralized planning. So it's kind of in between those two things. Okay. And I guess the way I'm thinking, and when you were talking about all the great things that, that happens, is that it doesn't mean that those things can't happen. It would just have to happen in a different way. Like, um, like if people are like, oh, you know, Juan is an amazing, like, let's give him the resources to do X, Y, and Z. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it, it just wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a VC. It would be your your community that knows you you know yeah and so it'd just be different it would it wouldn't be it does i, I i'm i'm i i doubt it would look the same to tell you the truth to be very honest i don't think it would have it would be as fast and i don't think it would be as spectacular but i think it would be more steady and and i don't know it just it just seems i feels like i feel like it would be different but but it, you can get a lot of the same stuff like let's put our resources here let's put our resources there let's let's invest in this guy and not in that guy i think <laughs> therein lies my skepticism though because the people who are the most effective allocators of capital were the people that were actually successful in building an enterprise where the success of the enterprise was predicated on their ability to allocate the capital True. That's true. That's a good point. But um, yeah, I, I guess uh, there's ways. I guess there's ways you could demonstrate that that don't have to necessarily because you know, I don't know. Like I, you know how Donald Trump always says he's the best businessman, but he just was rich. <laughs> like he just he he like failed his business a million times. But he just kept mm -hmm. getting more. You know whatever. Um, and he's very he's very open about that actually. Um, but the, so just because he's big and powerful doesn't mean he's like passed some kind of test that he's the right one. Like I, I feel like there's certainly have to be more people than besides him that deserve the money that he's been had. One to thing, to. one thing to say about that though, as far as like capital allocation goes, the like beautiful thing about capital allocation is that you know like venture capitalists raise mm -hmm. funds, right? Mm -hmm. And they have to raise funds from other people that have capital that are willing to allocate it in order yeah. to get a return, right? Yeah. And their ability to raise funds is predicated on their performance as a venture capitalist and their ability to assess which startups yeah. are actually feasible and which aren't feasible right. and their experience informs that mm -hmm. so theoretically we wouldn't think about trump as a person that has much power as for, as far as like from a capital allocation perspective right. because if he just took his capital and tried to allocate it yeah. he's not very knowledgeable about startups or a lot of emerging technologies true, true. so he would fail and lose his capital yeah. and that capital would then again be redistributed right. to right. individuals that are actually effective allocators right. Other than he would borrow more you know anyway yeah yeah, yeah no, I, I get your point um well you know i, I went, earlier when you were talking i was thinking of this marxist principle which i like and i keep i always try to think about it and talk about it and it's very not capitalist but i just wanted to hear what you think about it which is it's, it goes from each according to their ability to each according to their need which is a very different way to think about how human beings would deal with each other. Um, it's it's back to that. It's back to the decision my students made, like to give an A to everybody, even if they didn't do anything. Um, and um, I, I I really I really like that idea, which is that you know, um, it like that people. Every, it actually recognizes human difference, like you were saying before. There's like lazy people, there's hardworking people, there's this kind of people and this kind of people, and um, you know, you would sort of discover who you really are in, in a system like that um, because there would be no, you wouldn't be forced all the time and you wouldn't be like punished so much by the kind of, um, you know, the, the, way, the, the, way, the way capitalism does. Capitalism is very harsh in a way. It's like, it's like you, you win, you lose, you know. Um, but um, I, I feel like, I, I haven't fully thought this out. This is sort of a work yeah. in progress, but um, it just like, what I felt was like the generosity of this, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example. In an earlier class, um, they, they made the same decision that, like, I, I, this was a class where I told everybody they could have, their final grade would be, they could decide for themselves, mm -hmm. um, which I found out was illegal, so I can't do it anymore. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and they did decide to give everybody an A. Well, actually, no. First, one student said, but wait a minute, that's not fair, because if I work really hard and I give myself, like, an A- minus or a B plus, and somebody does literally nothing, gives themselves an A, why, how is that fair? And then another student said, well, what is it to you? Like, it's not like a zero sum situation. Like you should just give yourself the grade that you want, like that you think you deserve and don't worry about other people. And that changed uh, the whole mood of the class from this competitive, like anxious, like struggle into something else. And I, I think that space is something that it would be really nice to explore more. You know, like um, I understand, you, I almost can imagine what you're going to say back, like, oh, but then there'd be no incentive. There'd be no pressure. There'd be no you know competition and all that stuff. Um, but it's it's just a very different way to think about politics and and, and human t togetherness, and um, I think like like I said in the anarchist in the actual time when anarchists had power, they tended to have a mixture of these things. Like some mm. t some people decided that they wanted to stay under that kind of pressure, and some people didn't. And I just like that you have the option. You know, like you can so. Um, what what ended up happening actually in the Spanish Revolution was that the firms like 
every firms were, were organized very differently. Like I said, some still had capital. Some were still run by capitalists. They didn't take them away from them. Some were completely collectivized and had no money at all and were just about whatever. And some were like this mixture and people could just go where they wanted. Like you still wanted to work for capitalists? It was fine. You could. And, to, to be honest, very few people did want that because those tend to be the most exploitative, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they, they were interested in getting a more, more money you know, for themselves and, and more power and stuff. So, so it, over time, it became much fewer of those, but they never forced them to shut down or anything. You know? um, so it's just like, I think, I think rather than having a one size fits all model, it'd be nice to have variety and you could live the way you want. You know, if you want to live in a hardcore capitalist thing, there should be a space for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that shouldn't be the only space, you know? And that's the problem with our world is that's the only space. Like everything is just that. And I think it's so twisted with all this other stuff we were talking about earlier, racism and all that stuff that it's just like, it's, it's just bad because like there's nothing, because when that gets all twisted, then we, then that's all we have. And then, you know, we have all these problems. Yeah, so it's just as a fun thought. I, I've wondered, you know, like with AI, and I know Elon has Neuralink, which is crazy, and then Zuck's working on the metaverse. If in like the next 200, 300 years, you could sort of just like plug yourself into a metaverse, and if you want to work in an anarchist society, yeah. you just sort of like emulate your, yeah. your anarchist well, yeah. friends. And then I, you could really modulate what environment you'd want to live in, could. and everyone could actually really have their own. Yeah, yeah, but that would all be virtual, you mean, right? Like. Yeah, but it, it'd feel real. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I guess it depends I'd like how... it to be in real life, but okay, sure, I'll yeah. take that as a start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could actually, that could change things, because, you know, what's interesting is the internet when it was first created was supposed to be this anarchist breakthrough like mm -hmm. and, it, and in some ways it started with that promise and it has really revolutionized everything but i think big firms have learned how to like throw their weight in a way that has oh, yeah. sort of distorted it and made it not really anarchist after all so yeah i mean and i, I don't know if that would happen with the metaverse i hope not i mean you could practice you could you could it, it's it, i'm not yeah i i think i i'm not anti-technology at all i think technology is great but it's a place where you know it's, it's, it's not automatically one thing or another. It's not either good or bad. It's just, it's just what people make of it. So I think, you know, I think, uh, I'm not sure the metaverse would do the trick, but if it does, awesome. You know, I'll, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, and then one last thing uh, I wanted to touch on, uh, just to sort of like round out our whole like conversation about yeah. capitalism was, and, and just to offer a little bit more skepticism. I don't think this is really congruent with the classroom example, mm -hmm. but I think I've sort of like pinpointed what it is, like the fundamental disagreement that makes me disagree with this idea of like to each their own mm -hmm. it's that if in like and, and in the classroom example you know there's going to be a cohort of students probably the majority that aren't going to do much work but then there's going to be students that want to be productive yeah. and they yeah. can choose to be productive yes. yes and we're sort of conceptually thinking about this idea where the students that don't want to be productive should like be able to exist yeah. in like this uh life of like unproductivity mm -hmm. and the students that uh do want to live a productive life can lead that yeah. and that to each their own yeah but the problem with that is, is that the, the productive students are going to have to be the ones that support the unproductive mm -hmm, ones. Mm -hmm. And by just like the nature of unproductivity, it's like we, we could expect most people to want to be unproductive. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, it becomes sort of like unsustainable yeah. for the productive people yeah. to support the unproductive people. And therein lies sort of the need for a capitalist system for human beings, mm, yeah. where the majority of people would prefer to just be unproductive okay, than good, productive. Good point. I, I have a counter. I have a counter point. Cool. <laughs> I think that. One of the problems with capitalism is that it, it distorts who and what we are. I think a lot of people are unproductive, not because they're lazy or stupid or whatever, but just because they just feel completely like shut out, you know? And um, I, I don't know the answer actually. I, I think if, if, it was a, if it was a genuine system without like the profit motive, we might see very different people step up in ways that we didn't think coming, you know, mm -hmm. like we, we, who, who knows? I, I think the, I think the fact that you have so much unpredictable, I mean, I agree with your analysis, at least in this local, in the immediate sense. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people just, you know, a lot of my students are just, they're just kind of defeated by life. You know, they're, they're broken a little bit. They're, they're, yeah. they're working class. They're treated like crap, you know, whatever. Um, that doesn't mean that they, that they're not capable of great things. You know, they're just, you can't, you can't confuse the, the end result of years of being treated badly and all that. With, with with what they're capable of like i think you know in a weird way i think one of the, my critiques of capitalism it's a huge waste because you could have somebody who's like a janitor who could be like the best poet in world history but you're never going to know it because they you know they were they didn't have a good education you know what i mean like mm -hmm. you don't you don't know and um this reminds me of another thing that i'm not a marxist but i there's a lot of things of marx i like and he has this really i was just teaching it to my students the other day it's a hilarious thing where he says that under capitalism 
each person's worth is only given to them by the amount of money that they have, and that is completely distorts who they are. So he says, for example, he's, he's sort of pretending to be this like rich guy. He says, he says, I am super ugly, but I have tons of money so I can have beautiful girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And I am a moron, but I have tons of money so I can hire really smart people to do the thinking for me. And I'm, you know, I'm a coward, but I can hire big guys to punch people <laughs> and beat them up so I can be the bravest guy in town. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he says, in a communist world, you would have to you wouldn't get any dates if you didn't make yourself worthy of dating you mm -hmm. know what i mean you wouldn't have this distorting element of, of money um and I, I always found that so you wouldn't even know what you are as an individual unless you were able to you're in a situation where you could actually be an individual as opposed to one where your individuality is given to you by your bank account i um, think we've sort of arrived at like where our fundamental differences and how we view capitalism which is I view capitalism as the vehicle and then our political leaders as the ones driving it yeah so to me it's like an individual that has a ton of money and uh, I'm not sure if it was a Karl Marx or if some, someone else's line that was talking about uh, they could have whatever dates they want. Yeah, to me, and like, sure, the money could attract the types of women that only care about money, mm -hmm. but he can't purchase genuine love and affection from a woman. Or the individual who's a moron, right. it, I, I would disagree with that because if they're ineffective allocators of capital because they're a moron, they're going to be stripped of their capital and then right, it's going right. to be redistributed right, to effective right, allocators right, of right, capital, right? Right. Um, and I think throughout the conversation, I've heard you attribute a lot of, you know, you were talking about how your students, a lot of them feel sort of beat up. Mm -hmm. They've been working class. They struggle through a lot. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's important to differentiate what is the individual's responsibility mm -hmm. and sort of like the individual's uh, sort of like pursuit or issues to deal with and what is sort of like capitalism's sort of conceptually responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because to me, it's like, Capitalism is just sort of like the framework and our politicians and individuals inhabit it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of maybe the, the feelings of being beat up might just be individual decisions people have to make about being yeah. more courageous. Mm -hmm. But there are certain examples where like the, let, let's say, you know, back then when there was factories and like there was child labor. Mm -hmm. In those situations, I wouldn't attribute that to capitalism per se. I'd attribute it to like the regulatory environment, so meaning the political leaders yeah. that are driving the car yeah. capitalism. Yeah. And that sort of like absolves a lot of maybe the, the negative um, attributions you've made to capitalism. Yeah. And to me, sort of just results in this sort of like really positive and optimistic picture yeah. of capitalism yeah. for me personally. I mean, I wish I shared that with you because I'd be a more optimistic person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just think like the machine that's driving capitalism is itself being driven by capitalism. I guess that's okay. different. So like, uh, I, you know, we're obviously not going to agree on that, but um, that's why I think differently. I think that the politicians who are supposed to regulate capitalism are tend to be doing what capitalism wants them to do again not in a conspiratorial sense not like here's your marching orders like here you know but just it's just the way the system works it, it has a logic of its own and um it, it's it's just it just works the way it does mm -hmm. um and i think uh yeah i i, I mean i'm never going to become a fan of capitalism i guess mm -hmm. but that's okay i mean I, it's i i really enjoyed talking to you about this and it's been really fun yeah um even if we don't agree on everything so uh, i know we took a, a quick intermission for for the audience um I just want to get to the closing question. Last sure. question I wanted to ask you, and uh, really, the, I ask this question to, to every guest, and sort of the, the importance of the question to me is that I think that a lot of what um, we as individuals and as Americans can do to mobilize and uh, make paint a much more energetic picture to, to younger people mm -hmm. is to sort of talk about what we would like to study if we were much younger. Mm -hmm. And that question sort of like enables you to sort of think about what you find most exciting and maybe some of, what are some of the more like optimistic parts of your outlook mm -hmm. uh, on the country. So uh, I'd like to ask if you were 20 years old at this current moment, what fields would you study and what problems would you aim to solve? And then maybe if you could speak to what you're excited about next 50, 100, 150 yeah, years. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I was an academic, so I was always much more uh, abstract and theoretical than I, and as I've gotten older, I've realized that that's not where it's at. Like, you really need to be, like, my work in the union has been so interesting and so great for me because it's much more hands-on, it's much mm -hmm. more practical, and, I mean, it's really helpful to have an academic background because it helps you think these big questions, you know, as, as, you, as you do, too, um, but it's also good to have experience in the world, and I think I would try to sort of mix more than I did in, re in, in my life. I would mix practical experience much more with academic thought because I think it helps inform each other. Mm -hmm. And I would have, I would have much, I think that would have been great. I, mean, I'm, I'm, I sort of discovered it late, late in life. I used to find politics horrible because what would happen was I would get involved in something. I was always on the far left, of course. And then, mm -hmm. You know, all the people, all my friends that were liberals would betray me uh, in my mind, you know, mm -hmm. and then I would get mad at them and I wouldn't want to talk, you know, it was, it was, it was bad. Um, and so I've just learned how to 
tolerate all that stuff better and just deal with that better as a, as a as an older person. Do you think um, you'd still study politics if you were? Yeah, I think politics is fast. I love politics. I think it's one of the most interesting things. I think politics and human psychology are my two favorite subjects, and mm -hmm. they're so connected. You know, yeah. like people are so interesting and so complicated, and uh, and in, in a way also very simple. Like when you understand the psychology of why people are doing what they do, it, it all makes sense. Like once you figure it out, it makes sense in a, in a good way. So. I think um, I think that's oh you know we're we're humans so of course we find humans very interesting I don't think there's anything wrong with that I think um, one other thing I would like to have known more about is the environment because when I was mm. a kid believe it or not global warming was not a thing like nobody talked about I mean, we talked about pollution and we worried about nuclear war pollution was definitely a thing pollution but... <laughs> was a thing and it's, that's gotten better that's yeah. pollution got, when I was a kid like the air sucked it was like like I remember really yeah it was like you couldn't see like 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 I remember like maybe like a early 20s not a kid but um driving in la and i couldn't even see the buildings because it was so dirty wow. so it's so, that's so much better now mm -hmm. in other countries right now in india and in china they're like that right now mm -hmm. so it's, it's just us but um but the whole thought of the whole planet like having problems was just never occurred to to anybody or maybe it's some really smart scientists but i think it would have been nice to sort of see that coming a little bit and to sort of think about that so if i was 20 today i would definitely be on that that would be the other thing that I'd really think is really important because, you know, quite frankly, if the world all is unlivable, then then there's no point for politics, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of get our priorities straight and get make the world a safe place. I spoke to Professor Belkin uh, last night about what I find most exciting about politics, and it's that, um, you know, I don't know anybody my age or even just me myself. Like my pol political media consumption is consolidated mostly in like YouTube clips mm -hmm. and like Substack articles. Yeah. And independent journalists. I don't watch cable news at all or even mm -hmm. just like established journals. Yeah. And to me, when I think about platforms like Substack or YouTube, it's like, oh, wow, now um, the political ecosystem, politi political commentary ecosystem is shifting in a way where there's independent journalism mm -hmm. and their funding, it's sort of like crowdsourced and mm -hmm. it's predicated on their past behavior and uh, right. whether they act in an integ uh, integ uh, manner with integrity or yeah. they yeah. behave in a, you know, they lie, they yeah, say things yeah. that are untrue, and yeah. things in bad faith. And that to me, just sounds so exciting, and I wonder how that's gonna uh, gonna affect politics. Also, hearing you know, sort of like dark horse or um, uh, independent or um, smaller presidential candidates that are running, people like Vivek, mm -hmm. people like RFK, people like Dean Phillips, they engage with these independent uh, mm -hmm. journalists and platforms so much more, mm -hmm. and it sort of makes me think about wow, like when this sort of like ecosystem matures 20 years from now, we're like politicians normally go on independent platforms that are funded by you know the crowd of people that yeah. value them yeah what is that going to do to shift politics shift the way uh you know campaigns are funded uh the, right. the, the topics and the issues politicians focus on and also the way politicians sort of like crowd uh crowdfund ideas yeah. and uh struggles and perspectives yeah. of the people that are uh, part of their constituency yeah that's a great it's a great thing to think about i i i'm i like i said before i think i'm not against technology i think technology is just what, what you make of it so mm -hmm. i don't think it's either good or bad as such but i i do think it's having a radical effect and currently i think the effect is largely negative but based on what you just said it might be that we have a learning curve like we it's just it's still fairly new and um, people need to be better curators or connoisseurs of these things i think unfortunately there's way too much conspiracy theory and and like fake you know false things and lies and all these innuendos and stuff that have and but to me that's sort of a, it's just a symptom of the fact that we don't get to have real meaningful political conversations with each other but the same exact forum could be could allow for those like mm -hmm. in other words the same mechanisms could allow for the very kind of conversations that i'm talking about to happen i don't think they happen right now because i think it's too it's still very top down it's still I don't know. I, I think people just need to get to, to learn how to be better consumers of information on this new in these new technologies than we are, because um, I think what tends to happen is people go down weird rabbit holes. Do you watch I, a lot of politics on like platforms like YouTube, Twitch? Um, not Substack? not that much. Not that I'm not super media savvy, and I actually sort of try to avoid it because it it makes wrong guesses about me all the time, and then I don't huh. want to go down the rabbit hole they want me to go down. Oh, like the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. They they they, they can't figure me out. Yeah, I guess reason. the more you use it, the, the better it calibrates. Exactly. But yeah. I would recommend you check it out because it is crazy. You know, people talk about uh, individuals in Gen Z not having large attention spans and also being politically apathetic. Just to give you an example, there's this guy called Destiny. He's sort of known as like the forefather of the progressive progressive political commentary and he's really really progressive uh -huh. um and this guy you know he'll post like 
two to three hour long unedited live yeah, streams yeah. that he live streams live, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On a daily basis. Yeah. And he'll pull like 250, 300,000 views for videos that That's have only amazing. been out for yeah. a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you contrast that with like CNN viewership, yeah. which is mostly probably like malls and airports yeah, and gyms. Yeah, 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 totally. You know? yeah, and yeah. like that's Gen Z who we right. think of as like having such short attention spans. Exactly. That to me, it just makes me so excited. And also if you uh, sort of like evaluate the um, collaboration and, and debate, it's super healthy yeah. online. Maybe not healthy that, you know, there's people that are disrespectful, but people engage from all different mm -hmm. sorts of backgrounds and it yeah. allows for sort of like the, the, the counter arguments to a lot of conspiracy theories that people make to be presented to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so much more than cable news platforms where like you yeah. don't see a Don Bangino going on Rachel Maddow. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I, 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 by the way, because I'm a teacher, I know Gen Z very well. Mm -hmm. Like they're not neither apathetic nor uh, have short extension spans. They just need to be, you know, I, I just I think what that is is older people who discount all the stuff you've been talking mm -hmm. about. Like, yeah, whatever. That's not that's not real. Um, no, I, I, they're very engaged, and I think uh, I, I have a lot of. I always have hope for the future from from the younger generation. I think that uh, you guys are way more on top of things than we were. But I do think that the world is a lot scarier than mm -hmm. it used to be, and uh, you know, um, I think that's not always a bad thing in a way because I think it's people are taking politics more seriously now. Like my children, both are, are like you know they're not just going to sit around and like be dictated at. Um, so I, I, I think it's good. Um, I hope that social media can become. If if the, if it's it's followerism, right? If 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 the if the if the consumers of social media can become better consumers, then it won't. Then you can tell all the lies you want, and nobody's going to buy it. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. it, you only you only buy lies if you're willing to buy lies, right? And you so, you know, uh, all that psychology. I don't know how it all works. So I yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of hopeful about all that. I, I I'm not down on social media at all. I should I should use it more. I'm very suspicious of it. Um, you know, I was I was, I was for a while I was on PayPal, and I saw that like blah blah just bought like. 10 pounds of carrots and I was like oh my god why would anyone want to know that Whoa. and I just I, as an older person I have a sense of privacy that young people just mm -hmm. don't have and I was like there's no way I want anyone to know yeah. so I just eliminated it um, but that's just that's just like stupid but um, yeah I, I think I think there's a brave new world so you know we're, we're, it's happening whether I like it or not so uh, hopefully it'll turn out well <laughs> And hopefully we'll all listen to each other. But. Well, thank you so much, Professor Martel. I think we had a really beautiful conversation. I do too. And a big part of what I want to accomplish with Atlas is I think um, a lot of Gen Z's political discourse seems to be really combative and lacking in compassion. And I think having conversations where we just express, uh, express a lot of the political disagreement today and having it in a healthy way yeah. offers the opportunity to sort of like learn more about each other and arrive at like better solutions and better ideas. So I really, really appreciate our I, conversation today. I appreciate today. you too. I pre this was great. Thank you so much for doing this. It yeah. was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I Thanks everybody you, for watching. Bye. <laughs>